Hi everyone, and um, welcome to the Firefish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. I'm your host, Cameron McLennan. Joining me today is Alan Hiddleston. Say hi, Alan. Hi. <laughs> and Louise Triance, the MD of UK Recruiter. Hello. Hey, Louise, um, do you want to kick us off by telling the people that are in today a little bit about yourself? Okay, thanks. Um, so I've been running the UK Recruiter site for about 17, 18 years now. Um, my background is in recruitment. So I used to work for an exec search company for about 10 years before that. Um, and started running events for recruiters on how to use the internet as part of the recruitment process, uh, moved on to creating the website. And now we've built a community of recruiters. So obviously with the domain UK recruiter, we stuck our stake in the ground, very UK focused. It's agency, it's in-house, it's um, sources, resources, headhunters, agency recruiters, all sorts of recruiters we work with. And as well as the stuff we have on our website, <clears throat> we do events for recruiters. And we have been for, I reckon, nearly 15 years. Brilliant. <laughs> cool. Well, we're really excited to have you on, Louise, because we know that you know almost everything there is to know about running events. No. Um, <laughs> and no pressure. But I just wanted to kind of kick things off by uh, one of the one of the kind of big questions, and it's become like a hot topic recently because it has been, you know, a bit of a, I guess, a trend um, to have, you know, for recruitment uh, recruiters to run events. But why do you think that face-to-face -face networking still has a has a place in recruitment today? I I I guess it's quite an interesting one. I mean, the, the bottom line is recruitment is a people business. There's absolutely no denying that. I think there actually has been a trend to moving away from recruiters communicating with the, with their clients and their candidates over the phone and face to face. I think that more and more recruiters, when you look on LinkedIn groups and Facebook groups, are talking about how they make contact through um, LinkedIn emails or through um, Twitter DMs. And they're talking about ways in which they can basically not talk to a candidate, mm. Um, mm. which I which I think is obviously really wrong. I don't think you can deny that the majority of businesses need to operate on the basis of meeting your client, even if not your candidate. And I think that meeting candidates is really important. So I suppose that face to face events are part of that in that maybe you don't organize them, but maybe you go to them. And that's one of the ways in which you can interact with people who may or may not be clients, but may become clients. Um, and I think that for clients, it's especially important. I mean, maybe we shouldn't make a differentiation between clients and candidates. Mm -hmm. And some businesses don't. I know Steve, I was talking to Steve Ward earlier, and he was saying that they, they really try not to. But for lots of businesses, yes, you know, you're, yeah. if you don't hire senior people, then it could be a very long time before a candidate does become a client. Yeah. But I think that for both parties, meeting them face to face at networking events or um, business events or corporate entertainment events. I think that that events in the recruit for recruiters and in the recruitment space are important and for, and for recruiters as well, you know, meeting with other recruiters too. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, sorry. Yeah, so you're almost saying it's the kind of counter to like the digital age, basically, because, you know, so much is just like, it's just online, isn't it? And yeah. like, right now, like we've got probably the phones vibrating and we've got chat going on the right hand side and Twitter's open and stuff and things as well. And it's so easy to, to connect with so many people in different channels, but there's a certain like, I guess, relationship development thing that you only get in a in a face-to-face -face event. Absolutely. So I work from home. I can go easily an entire day where I only speak to one person on the phone. Um, and that's fine for some days. And then it, it, it's not the way I can't operate my business like that. So I'm going to an event tomorrow in London, um, partly because I want to see some of the speaker presentations, but also because I want to meet up with people who I've either already got relationships with or feel I could have. There's a specific person I'm meeting tomorrow who I want to sponsor some of our events and I think I need to, I need to meet with them in order to to make that relationship happen yeah yeah cool. it's a good point I think one of the key things for that I've noticed in the recruitment industry is quite often like in our own space in the software space people are are quite forward about sharing best practice 
things that work for them uh, and and really it's it's same in the marketing sector as well steve will vouch for this as well everyone it's just a big open forum where everyone gets together and they share what works what doesn't work but recruitment it's very much like oh i've got the secret sauce to what makes my agency successful i'm not sharing it with anyone else yet now we're seeing that people are starting to come together and 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 share that so um <laughs> Why do you think a lot of the recruitment agencies are kind of afraid to get together and share info like that? I think part of the answer is in what you just said. It's, it's that I think that even though we say that recruitment is a marketing exercise as much as sales, it's still sales. So marketing people are happy to share a lot more. Absolutely. Um, and I think that salespeople, for whatever reason, are reticent to do that. So... There's a fear that you might be giving away a, a secret, even to someone who's not in the same sector as you. Mm. There might be this, this, you know, I'm going to tell you how I'm doing it and you're going to do it. And somehow, even though we don't share the same clients, you're going to benefit to my detriment, which I don't think is true. Um, but luckily, not everyone feels that way. So we've been doing our directors events for probably six years now. Um, and I know when we started, there was people who said to me, these will never work. You will never get recruitment people in the same space talking about how they are growing their business. Mm -hmm. And we do. We don't get them all. And there's all. And interestingly, we had um, a conversation for the first time in five years where somebody said to me, I there's absolutely no way I'd come to one of your events. Why would I share the secret of my success? <laughs> I just said, well, don't. Don't come. Uh, yeah. It's baffling. And like, it's with the people that have attended, like how... How have you managed to buck the trend versus some of the other uh, the other industries out there, the other events out there? I suppose that I've not tried to do massive events, and I think that size is is quite an important issue for anybody thinking of setting up an event. So whether it be rec to rec or whether it be dealing with um, your own market sector, is to think about a realistic size of event. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm, I don't know whether I'm making an assumption here, but I think for recruiters, being in a small group environment possibly feels safer. So you know who else is there. So when you turn up, you can look at the attendee list and you can see that your main competitor isn't there. Or if they are, you know who they are. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's how the, the director's events are 60 people tops. So mm -hmm. in that environment, it does feel more like you're talking amongst friends. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably helped. The other thing which maybe has helped with ours is that the speakers are all other recruitment business owners. So yeah. So maybe feels slightly more of a level playing field that you've got something else to offer, not just going along to learn. You know, you're going to listen to what someone's got to say, but maybe you also feel you can get something um, out of it in sharing your own ideas too. Um, I don't know. They, they 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 work and and um it can't just be the cakes and the booze but maybe that helps <laughs> <laughs> louisa i think it's a really really good point though isn't it it's like trying to create that environment and not, and not really being afraid as well because you know if you are a recruitment agency and you're thinking about organizing an event that's you know recruitment focused in the content like you've got to be nervous about the fact that maybe some of your competitors are going to show up there and some of your clients are going to show up there as well by the nature of like you're organizing it yeah so. um it's an interesting thing which you said cam you said about um in the software world people sharing ideas but when we first started doing the tech events mm -hmm. so that's where we get 20 technology companies together and 10 of them are crm so you've got nine competitors at that event yeah when we did the very first one I had some feedback from some of the attendees about who they didn't want to be positioned next to because they didn't want their competitors to see their pitch. And then as these events have run on, I think people have realized that that's not the threat. And what I really love about the, the tech events is towards the end of the afternoon when people go into the workshops and you're just there in the space, you're getting value from talking to people who are your competitors. Yeah. As an event organizer, maybe you should try to embrace that. So if you are running an event, say you specialize in the HR sector, you're running an event for HR clients and candidates. Yes, you might get some other recruiters turning up, um, but, but really try to not see that as a threat and to make the most of it. I mean, maybe you don't want your very aggressive main competitor there trying to pitch to candidates. That probably isn't gonna work for anybody at the event, yeah. maybe being a little bit less scared of it, 
a good point. Yeah, I think that's really, really good insight. And definitely like from ourselves attending the events stuff, we've made some really good relationships with, with all our vendors. And from time to time, we'll get people that will come to look at our, our solution. Maybe they're doing high volume temps or whatever. They're not the right fit for us. And we've had we've built those relationships now where we can go, hey, like go and speak to these guys or go and speak to them. And it's like there is actually merit in making, you know, starting relationships with these other businesses as well. And I think that's that's sometimes missed. No one can take the whole market. So in, in the recruitment event space, there's tons of events now. And maybe sometimes it stresses me out a bit when someone does things very similar to what we do. But there's so many people that they can't all go. You know, I couldn't hold an event where everyone went to and nobody and they wouldn't want to. Different, yeah. different things for people. Yeah. Cool, cool. That's a really good point. So kind of moving on with that, obviously it can be kind of like dangerous, you know, mixing uh, business and pleasure at times. Cheers. Oh, it's all right for some, isn't it? Um, but, you know, why do you think uh, on that topic, why do you think that, you know, corporate event budgets are being cut? Um, and so what, you know, what impact do you think that has on relationships as a whole? I mean, do you think that the fact that people aren't being, uh, because people aren't being allowed to kind of like, you know, splodge on, you know, these kind of like ex exuberant events as much, like that's really having an, an impact on relationships? Or do you think it was it was too far in the past in, in the other direction? Um, I don't know. I knew you were going to mention this, um, the, the, the corporate entertainment budget, and I've never worked for a business with a corporate entertainment budget at all. So I did a bit of asking around mm. um, because I think that there was a lot of um, splurging in the, the 90s um, with people um, taking, you know, an, an, an entire team somewhere so that they could try to get business from them. Mm -hmm. and, then, and in the recruitment space, you know, in the high street agency space, there was – um, you know, recruiters and clients out for lunch every single day or potential clients out for lunch every single day. And I do think that's stopped. Um, I think part of it actually is the, there was the bribery act. So I think that yeah. some businesses, especially in the public sector, just had to say, no, I can't mm. go for lunch. I can't take that whiskey. In the, in the temps space, in the construction part of that, when I was in recruitment, it, it every single potential client client senior candidate got a bottle of scotch at christmas and i don't know whether that still happens but in terms of the more sophisticated corporate entertainment i think that it, it is it is still happening i think you're right probably not as much as it was and i think that it's just a, probably a, as an important part of the marketing mix as anything else maybe it's a more obvious place to cut money mm -hmm. than some of the other places but but i, I do think it's important and um, running events, I think, is probably a more inclusive way of spending your budget. Yeah. Taking clients to football, rugby, sports, whatever it is. Um, and I think you can probably touch, so to speak, a lot more people in one go by spending your money in, in, in that type of way. Yeah. And Steve, mm -hmm. Steve had mentioned to me that um, one of the companies he works with was doing cheese and biscuit parties, which is just so cool. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, Do you know what? Yeah. I'm going to try and introduce those to the recruitment space. Um, because it's kind of fun and it's not doesn't have to be around actual recruiting. It's around getting people together to have a chat for a couple of hours. I like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I think like, I mean... I, the wine is correcting me. I can't even read this. <laughs> yeah, the I th wine was the important part. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. That that always gets, uh, gets the, the conversation <laughs> flowing, doesn't it? But I think that, you, you know, my personal opinion is it's kind of, I've been there, in, in, in the past, like prior company to, to Firefish spent, you know, like maybe four or five grand on like a kind of business dinner with like a big group of people. Um, and, and then coming to Firefish where like my, my entertainment budget's 50 pound a month, yeah. um, <laughs> as I often joke with Wendy about, but, but I think it like, it beats creativity, doesn't it? It just means that you need to like, uh, you need to go out there and do things a bit differently, you know. Um, you can, you might be much more creative, like Steve suggests, like some cheese and cheese and wine, rather than just like, you know, those big corporate events where it is like, you know, a box at the rugby or yeah. like taking people to the racing and stuff like that. You know, it, it, it sort of breeds creativity a bit more, I guess. Although, although I know that still happens. We've got a friend who does the the whole events thing, and his business is massively, massively rocketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. maybe in some spec sectors there is a lot more spend available than perhaps in in the recruitment space. I can't believe you're having a beer on a. <laughs> 
Come on, it's, it's after four o'clock. Well, that's the case. Sorry, I take it back. <laughs> always, always beer o'clock in Glasgow. <laughs> um, if just so that kind of leads on to the next point I was going to ask you about. So, see if you are if you started a recruitment agency, you're a small agency, two or three people working for you, um, and you feel as though you're not well enough connected, or you don't have enough money in the business yet to host an event. What sort of advice would you give them to try and? bring a group of candidates or a group of clients together so i think probably the first thing i'd say is don't run a recruit don't run a recruitment event so make it not about recruitment so mm -hmm. think about what people in your space most want to talk about or learn about or share ideas about so if you yeah. could do something which was about knowledge sharing so if if it's about connections really. So you need to probably find somebody who has some valuable knowledge that they can share, persuade mm. them that they might want to um, be involved in an event. Um, try to find someone to partner with. So for our director's events, we work with RBS. Um, RBS pay for the hospitality for our events. And in return, we bring to them 60 recruitment directors four times a year. They like that, we like that. Mm. Otherwise you have to think about budgets to spend on you know, venue and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so I think if you can find a partner who doesn't directly conflict with you, that's yeah. a good idea. And obviously in the recruitment space, if you're if you're working with high net worth people or HR people or whatever it is, there'll be somebody else who wants to get in front of those people. So I think yeah. you start to explore your connections from that avenue and then you've got a partner who can help with the promotion. Um, but, but finding out what people want and bringing them together for it, I think the other thing to think about is um, the time of day you do events. So for me, for recruiters, recruitment agencies, I found they don't want to spend a whole day at an event. The tech event works because they're coming to look at technology. <clears throat> you yeah. can't do 20 tech providers in two hours. But for the business learning events, I think there's quite a lot of people who will invest in things like breakfast briefings mm -hmm. or late afternoon. The Recruitment Society have for years and years run evening events where they bring people together. So I think that don't overstretch yourself into thinking I need to do a full day event. Yeah. Do something which is maybe a lot shorter, cram it in um, to make people feel they've got really good value from it. Yeah. And then what you hopefully will find is some of the people who come to those events will be good future speakers, will be well connected to know other people. One of the things I'd say is never underestimate how giving people can be. So, you know, if you get in touch with five clients you've got a good relationship with, yeah. and say, I want to start something, have you got any ideas? That that sometimes could be for a recruiter. All it takes mm -hmm. is for them to say, well, actually, you know, I went to a really good event when I was based, you know, in a different company and this is how it worked and this is what I might want to do with you. Um, but they don't, they don't need to be massive. They don't need to be expensive. Yeah. Um, but you just need to think about what they want to get out of it. Yeah, that's a great answer. Loads of actionable tips there for people who are in that position to go away and do that. I just noticed um, Audra's come in and asked in the comments there, do you do any targeted Facebook adverts to promote um, attendees? I I have. I've paid for Facebook advertising for the tech events in 2015, mm -hmm. and it didn't work at all for me. I didn't okay. get anything back from it. But I think that might have been as much down to my ability as the, the, the however i done it, it might be my fault um i do know that for business events i know people who have used it again in the hr space yeah um and in the marketing space successfully mm -hmm. to target mm -hmm. people um mm -hmm. i mean i'm in a slightly difficult position be careful what i say here but recruiters um are very challenged with how they spend their time so yeah. getting to come along to an event is actually really really tricky yeah um, I'm very lucky to work with recruiters who want to invest in themselves and invest in their business, and they do come to the events. But I think there's quite a high percentage of the industry who are focused on the day job here and now, what they're doing. Um, and in other sectors, that's probably different. In the marketing sector, people are really focused on their own personal development and growing their own knowledge. Yeah. I think if you were a recruiter in that space, you'd be a lot more successful in getting people together. Yeah. Cool. Steve's also asking as well, any good tips on getting um, sponsors for events, Louise? Yeah, 17 years of being in the industry has made that a little bit easier for me. <laughs> um, I I don't think I operate in the same way as everybody else. So what I do is I, I, I am absolutely determined to over 
provide. So when I when I have a sponsor, I will charge them less than they would pay for any other event, and I will try to give them more. And my biggest fear with all the events I run is that I won't fulfil my obligation to my sponsors. And I think that if you have that attitude and people re recognise that's a genuine attitude, then sponsors are more likely to take a punt on an event with you. Yeah. So, um, I don't really have a problem getting sponsors for events because I've got quite a lot of history behind me of people knowing that I really do put the work in. Yeah. I guess that some events I think people struggle with sponsors for because they, they don't, the sponsor doesn't re doesn't recognise how they're going to get value back. So I guess it comes down to that again. Yeah. So if you're going to do a tech event and I say I'm going to put 100 people through the door, this is, these are the ways in which you can speak to them, then people say yes. If you say I'm doing a cheese and wine event <laughs> and you can come along but you can't talk to anybody there or beer, um, then maybe sponsors would be less keen so I think that making the proposition really clear so if you, if I was doing a cheese and wine event one of the things I might introduce at it would be a meet the expert session mm -hmm. where I would have maybe five sponsors who I know are interesting people and then I would maybe cut out part of that event so that they could have an opportunity to chat with people in a roundtable format Okay. And then as a sponsor, I think you think, well, actually, I can chat to people, I can mingle throughout the whole event, but also I've got an opportunity to showcase. Yeah. Um, and also when, when you're doing the introductions, I mean, oh, my God, I've done this myself. We did an event where I forgot to introduce who any of the sponsors were. Well, how awful. I felt terrible. But just saying, these are the people who are sponsoring. That person there knows about this. This person here knows about that. Yeah. Just m make sure that the attendees know who's there. And then sponsors will realise you've done all that you can. Yeah. Um, and also, if you can get sponsors who you can encourage to um, entice people along, that's even better. So better connected sponsors are worth charging less to. Okay. And Alex is asking as well, how many people do you need to have at an event before you think it's right to get sponsors? Well, we have 60 at our director's event, and they are all recruitment business owners. I... I don't know 30 people who are looking to buy the thing you've got mm -hmm. i wouldn't for, look at um, what jamie leonard does with his reconverse events it's 12 people 12 sponsors something like that okay and, and he's running them really really successfully because what he's doing is he's matching up people with need and putting them together but but i think that's different that's um speed speed networking um maybe for cheese and wine i want to say biscuits but cheese <laughs> and wine maybe you need to make sure there's a lot more people in the room before you mm -hmm. i don't know what do you think you pay for sponsorship well, what do you think i, I think like i mean uh, like you know our perspective i mean we're we come to your events louise we, we pay to obviously sponsor at some of your events and i think like the thing that that kind of keeps us coming back and sponsoring them without thinking is that you know you've built up like some credibility and if we speak to anyone else that attends those events they will say like we get great value out of that um and you know you get like a decent number of people coming to each one so it becomes a no-brainer and you're right like you price the sponsorship package at a price that's you know that's below what you might expect to to pay for it and you do make the effort to deliver extra value beyond that but if you you know compare that to there's a there's no shortage of events um that are that are out there that you can go to but i mean there was one event that we went to it was a couple of years ago and i won't mention the company was hosting it or even when it was because that would give away the event but there was 20 vendors there in one big hall with a sort of i guess like four foot table each and literally it was just a market big indoor market stall where you could kind of pitch your wares and um four people came the whole day yeah. Four, four attendees came the whole day. So, so and, that, think... and that is a risk, though, as an event organizer, mm. is that 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 could happen to anybody. I mean, I think that adding an event to a crowded market, I know the event you're talking about, adding an event to a crowded market is never a good idea. So mm. anybody, whether you're doing it for other recruiters or whether you're doing it for clients, do not copy what someone else is doing. Do not do the same as already exists, yeah. unless you are absolutely certain you can do it better. And there's another event since then which has occurred, which was pretty much the same thing, thinking that somebody, else, someone else thought they could replicate something which already existed, but do it better. Just don't. Yeah. Do your own thing. Um, and 
if that happens where you run an event and four people turn up, then you've just got to find a way to make those sponsors not think you're a complete tosser somehow because otherwise you lose your credibility. And I've been so lucky and I touch wood and I panic before every single event. Stephen O'Donnell will tell you, I do not shut up for panicking before every single event because I do believe that poor attendance is not always down to poor preparation. Yeah. Um, it, it, it really can happen. <coughs> Stephen actually put a question earlier on as well, and so did Alex, but I think we've kind of covered this. Like, how do you, well, no, actually, how, so how do you, I'll take this one from Alex first. I'll put my teeth back in before I say this. Um, how do you decide what event to uh, to run? So it's Alex's question. Yeah. How do you decide what event to run? I don't know. I mean, you. you I guess, does he mean, do you run a networking event? Do you run a roundtable event? I don't know. I guess you have to ask people. I, I'm, I'm always, um, thank you, Audrey. It's my favourite swear word too. Um, I, I guess I'm always thinking about who I know, who I can have communication with. I'm really open about having, um, asking for advice. So actually, Alex is somebody who I've spoken to about events, and he's been involved in our directors' events and helped us to look at some of the maybe small changes in the format. Um, I'll tell you what I have done, and I've done this a lot over the years. I've stepped completely outside of our space and looked at what other people are doing. So you look at what people are doing in other completely separate sectors. So mm -hmm. for me, I look at what they're doing in um, the legal sector, because I think that recruitment and the law firm structure can be quite similar. Yeah. Um, a state agency, I've looked at what they do in the way of events and networking events and marketing. Mm -hmm. So I guess that if I was looking, if I ran a recruitment agency which specialised in um contractors in a specific field i don't think there's any shame in looking at what someone else is doing in a completely different space yeah and seeing how they've made it work i've also phoned up event organizers who are not in the recruitment space and asked for their advice and asked them why they organize the event they organize and how they do it and people have phoned me up and i'd always be happy to talk to them so i think that if you run a good event you're probably happy for someone to ask you how you've made it great yeah so don't why not do that I mean, that's, there's no shame in that. Yeah, brilliant. That's great advice. Stephen asked as well, how do you contend with the huge array of seemingly um, competing events these days? How do I personally? Well, I just bang my head against the desk. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Um, it's just Can the way I it beer again? Yeah, yeah, beer, yeah, not on a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> it is frustrating. I think that um, I feel for recruiters. In, in the recruitment event space, I feel for recruiters, they're being bombarded with stuff. The Recruitment Agency Expo, um, who do manage to get people through the door, probably send about 40 emails to each person before their January, February event. Mm -hmm. And you see it all over social media, people going, oh my God, I've got another email from them. And it is so annoying and recruiters must get so wound up by it, mm -hmm. but they get the numbers through the door. And I think that we're all aware of that. So. Mm -hmm. I have to send a lot of emails and so does everyone else who runs events. Mm -hmm. And I do feel for recruiters because once they've made a decision to go or not go, they don't need those 27 other emails. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's just the way it is. You know, you try to do targeting, you try to do blogs about it. You try to do things like webinars around it so people can find you in a more organic way. But at the end of the day, we're all shouting into the same space. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. have an answer. I don't like it. <laughs> I think there's one uh, just in response to like Alex's question earlier as well. He was asking what type of event to run. One of the things that we've seen that we've actually been involved in is the true event series. So they and they've that's already a format that exists, and then they can get different people can get involved in supporting that. Um, and I know there's a few both like suppliers to recruitment industry and recruitment agencies as well have got involved in that and actually done something. I think it's been pretty productive um we so that is like another option as well you can just rather i guess than run, run your own event you can sort of like take a hand in in organizing an event and, and supporting it yeah and i think i think that actually that, that's the thing i've completely forgotten i was going to mention is that things like i'm not big on women in business only events but i think that that's that's like a, an established format so mm -hmm. um abby is involved in women in av event yeah, yeah. and i think that if there's already something like that or local business networking, BNI, all I don't know what they are, but there's loads of them. There's those type of things. If you can somehow get involved in those, um, 
local chapters. So there's a big breakfast chapter where we are. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's something which you can, it's not, not really a franchise, but it's that type of thing. It's like we were talking about, Alan, with the true, is it already exists. And maybe look yeah. at getting involved in something like that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I agree. Um, also, one in from Steve as well. He said, a common question is, as ever, what do we believe is the ROI of running events, time expenditure and effort versus direct income results as a consequence of the actions? Great question. Well, I mean, that's one which I guess you can answer. But it's the point I'd make is that when we get people who are interested in our events, I tell them how much it's going to cost. And I say to them, that's not the cost. The cost is the time in the prep you have to do beforehand and having four of your team there on the day and actually following up those leads. That's what your real cost is. It's not the money you pay me to come to the event. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's if I was a sponsor of an event, that's what I'd be thinking about is what the, the true cost and what the return on that is. Um, and I think that's for sponsorship. But I think you guys organized your own event. Mm. What, what, where were you looking at the ROI on that? I think, I think you need to, um, I guess, like from our perspective, the ROI on that event was we, we just set out that we wanted to do something that was going to be good and interesting in the recruitment industry. And we wanted to do something locally in Scotland that was going to be different and give back to that market. So I think with that and, and pretty much the first time that we invested in any type of event, you sort of have to like expect that you might get nothing from it. Mm. And then everything that you do get from it's an upside. So it wasn't necessarily financial. It was about feel good positioning, those type of things. Yeah, it was. It, it was about like trying to do something that no one had done before and, and actually give something, you know, to the local market as well and, and create something that was memorable um, and, and, you know, start to bring some some kind of different people into into the area as well. So some, some speakers and things. But I think that when you, if, if you kind of extend that out to, like other events, I mean, the first time that we kind of like sponsor any type of event, you know, you, you pretty much go in with the, on the basis that like we might get nothing from this. <laughs> and I always think that's why it's quite, it's quite hard to justify the first time I do a, an event and or a new event, because you need to go in with the expectation that, well, we might get nothing from this. And then you can walk away from it if you do get something from it and say, well, that's great. We got two, three, four, five, 10, 20 leads or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if it's an established event, then you kind of start to build a picture of, well, we know that if we spend, you know, X on this event, we'll get three times back on that or four times back or, or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, the other thing with established events is really, if you're looking to sponsors, I'm astonished at how few people ask me whether they can speak to other sponsors. Yeah, like, to see really? if they're getting an ROI. Yeah. Why would you not ask me that? You know, or actually, you can see who all my sponsors are. Why wouldn't you just say, "I'm going to get in touch with them and see what they got back from it"? Because because no, sometimes it doesn't work for people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it doesn't work because they didn't put anything in. I have to say, um, mm -hmm. and we found that with our directors' events is that that I think there's a an ROI that you can strongly influence as an exhibitor at an event. So if you went to the Recruitment Agency Expo and you stood behind your stand looking at a bit of paper for two days, mm. you know, and, we, and I see it, you're not getting anything back. Yeah. Um, and I think as an event organiser, I mean, Steve said here, always expect nothing other than visibility, uh, kudos, credibility. And if it makes money, then all good. But you have to put, even to get that, you have to put in a lot of effort. Um, and if you're putting that effort in, sometimes there's the knock on. It's not just at the event. It's all the stuff around it. Like he says, the visibility. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I know this with our own event. Sometimes clients have come to sponsors before the event from the content we've been putting out beforehand and from the content they've been putting out beforehand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we just brought someone on the other day there who saw Wendy's pitch in October 2015. I think it was and it stuck with him for that amount of time and he just wasn't ready the time he wasn't ready to attend the event he was thinking about doing something didn't do it and then after that came back and what stuck in his mind was was that pitch and the chat that he, that he had with her after it for a whole you know for that amount of time so yeah mind you her pitches are quite impressive that would stick in my mind for a good 10 years I think. <laughs> the yeah. liveliest picture we have yeah, yeah. Um, and our couple of good questions from Steve coming in here as well. So he's saying that um, 
can recruiters realistically employ an event manager? I've I've never seen that before. Have either of you seen that, Alan? Always. Well, uh, I think Bailey Bowen was doing some of that for Cranby Panda as part of her marketing stuff, but she's mm -hmm. probably the closest I've seen. Um, I I don't I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I wonder whether some of the very large agencies do have someone. I, I often get people who contact me who are in marketing who are responsible for getting their senior staff to speak at events yeah mm -hmm. but hosting their own you know if you're running an absolute shed load of events for a particular niche you're going to need somebody who can ha handle that and take it on because another mistake i see with events i won't rename them um is an event which pops up happens there's five weeks of activity and then you don't see anything again for it mm -hmm. if i was a recruitment agency running a series of events I'd want to be promoting it all year round. I'd want to be using content I've got from that event two months afterwards and two months before and video footage and all the rest of it. Yeah. So I think that if an agency was taking it seriously, then I, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a marketing function. Why not? That actually leads me on to my next question. So you, over the years, you've built up a really, really good brand and a really, really good engaged following as well. Does that help with the success of the events, do you think? I think it's got to. I think that people knowing at least vaguely what you're about mm -hmm. really, really helps. Um, it certainly did when we used to do the uh, Tiger Tiger drunk fests that we did, <laughs> which were really, and that was in the, yeah, yeah, lots of that. In the very early days of social media, that was just people knowing that's what we did and that's who we were. Um, and in many ways, it's a bit of a shame we had to stop doing them, but there were a few too many incidents. <laughs> That's a whole other show. <laughs> After party show, that is. Yeah, um, we'll have a separate call about that. Exactly. I don't know, you know, I don't. I think it helps to have people people who know who you are, but I don't think it's essential. I think that if you can manage to communicate well what you're trying to achieve, yeah, I wouldn't want to put off an agency who didn't feel they had a good presence from trying an event or mm -hmm. some form of um, hospitality because they felt they didn't have that presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Ideal. Well, Alan, anything else from you? Any, anything else? You good? I, I actually now have tons of questions based on Louise's last point, but Go for it. Probably, probably going to get way off topic. So no, I think that was great. There's some brilliant advice in there. Cool. Do you want to feel up? We've still got a bit of time if you want to fire it, if there's anything else you want to ask. Well, I actually did have one question for you, Louise. Um, when you started, and it was based on the um, chat that people uh, were asking about having your own community or your own events manager. But if you were thinking about that type of role, and you mentioned marketing a lot there, and like our experience, obviously, of running events is it's a lot about marketing. But what do you, what's your opinion on how much of that event type role is marketing and how much is the actual you know, logistics of where does this sit and where does that sit on the day? So for, it's tricky, isn't it? Because I've done, now I'm doing the same events over and over again. Yeah. So that part of it, I, I'm quite comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I think that you can't be disorganized and run events mm -hmm. um, successfully. And that is something I have seen happen with some really, really well-known events in our space, right. where the individual involved had a fabulous event but was not the most organized. Yeah. Um, and I think that over the years, you realize you need to tackle that. So I think that I think that you need to be organized enough to be able to, you know, if you're gonna provide lunch for people, actually have ordered the lunch um, <laughs> and uh, make sure you've booked all the rooms you said you're gonna book and make sure the AV works. So I think that there is, there is an element of just having decent organization skills. Um, I've been banging on about marketing, but we did try some direct sales for events. And I know that um, in other sectors, they do do that. It wasn't, it wasn't particularly successful for us. We had someone who did some um, delegate acquisition calls. Um, right. And I think that in other space, that could work quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if I was running a, if I was a recruiter running a sector event, I would consider some direct calls to clients to say we're running this event i'd really like to come mm -hmm. i think that could really work and of course that's more sales and marketing and yeah. um, you get your sales people to do that for you um but so much of it for me is about content mm -hmm. around events 
um, so that people are aware of what you're doing and when they go to the events page. You know, I do a blog post before each tech event, which is why you should come to this event. Yeah. And um, it has a lot of content behind that about what you're going to get from it and previous videos and photographs and um, narrative from previous attendees. And that's all content that someone has to produce. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if you're thinking of going to an event and you go to the event page and you can't really find anything out about it apart from the date and the time, it would probably put you off. So I do think you need to have a strong content piece behind it, whether that be an industry event within our recruitment space or whether that be something you're organizing for potential clients and candidates. Yeah, you want yeah. to know that it's going to feel how you want it to feel <coughs> and you need content to provide that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Well, that's, well, that's and, and, and I, I think, think you know, our, our, like some of the experience we've had at Firefish with events is that um, obviously, we, you know, you do need to really go for it with the marketing side of things. But I mean, we did make some calls when we had our, our own event and it was really interesting because it was a, an opportunity to just have non sales, mm -hmm. like product sales conversations yeah. with people in your target market with the kind of decision makers in your target market and just talk to them about a completely different product or service and actually just start to develop a relationship with them um you know and and in a way that maybe shows that we're giving something back to the market and and that was probably like a good kind of knock-on benefit for us and yeah um, i mean that's another thing when you look at the roi is when we do the directors events, I always say to the sponsors, invite some of your clients. It's a really mm -hmm. nice way to make contact with them without selling them something. Mm -hmm. And some of them do it and some of them don't. Forest Group, who've been a sponsor of our directors events for two years now, do that so well. So they will actually make contact with their warm prospects and invite them to the event. And they get a really good feedback from that because even if they can't come to the event, they know that they're at the forefront of their mind is someone who they believe wants mm -hmm. to benefit their own business they want to improve their business and it feels great i thinking about if i have more time i i probably ought to be doing that myself with our events yeah. but as you know it's just me so i don't but yeah absolutely Anne. i mean i think that that's that's a really great excuse to phone people isn't it yeah to give us a good a good opportunity a good sort of sounding board to speak to people in the in the market when as you say we're not trying to not trying to sell them anything so absolutely yeah. Yeah, I like that. Good tip. Cool. Well, that's us. We've about ran out of time, Louise. Thank wow. you very much for uh, coming in and joining us. Thanks very much for being the first guest on the new Crowdcast now that Blab is no more. It's good, isn't it, though? I'm happy with this. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be any, any glitches, no crashes. All good so far. Touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So, and thanks very much for everyone who came in today as well. As always, really appreciated it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm sorry I haven't made the side channel, but I will now. Thanks <laughs> so much, guys. All right, guys. Cheers. See you at the next one. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.